Okay. So on with unit three. So the first thing we now need to talk about is wind. Okay, and so this slide emphasizes that wind can be fun and wind can be not so fun. Okay, but whether you're enjoying the wind or you're cursing the wind, right, um, it's created by the same thing. I'm going to make it more official, but... See what I can do because that is what I wanted to do. Okay, so wind. We're talking about wind. We need to talk about wind. Did you guys notice? Is there much wind today? Oh, that's pretty. Because I always like, if you're like me, I look at the flag coming in the morning and my flag looks pretty still. <laughs> okay, so there's not wind, much wind right now. But in order to talk about wind, we need to talk about pressure. So, how many people in here have been working on their weather logs or turned in a weather log? Yeah. Oh, good. So one of the columns is pressure, okay? And so um, that actually is in, usually it's been in inches, or, okay? So you just report a pressure. Um, so what you're recording basically is what the gases here are doing, or at the station anyway. So gases are great for being, um, having a lot of motion. Gases gas particle can be here one minute and over there another minute. So they create a pressure. Okay. Um, so actually though, how do I say this? Um, well, another thing about pressure, have you ever put pressure in your tires? Okay. And a lot of times on the tire it will say um, put enough pressure in here that's like 65 PSI or something like that. The PSI stands for pounds per square inch. Okay. So basically what that means is for every little inch of rubber, they want 65 pounds hitting it, okay? It's, it's a pressure, PSI, pounds per square inch. Instead of inches of, of mercury, basically as we're walking around here, these nitrogen, mostly nitrogen, some oxygen particles that are hitting us, are hitting us about 14, almost 15 PSI, 15 pounds per square inch, okay? So, so there are some other units of pressure, though. That top one, I'm going to put the word next to that. Okay, these are just different units of saying how much pressure, how the, what kind of pressure those gas particles have. Okay, so this one is oftentimes used for maps. Okay, the pressure units for a map. Now, specifically, an MB stands for milli bars. It's like a metric milli, like milliliters, milligrams, millibars. Okay, and actually, and sometimes this makes it to my test, but instead of 14.7 pounds per square inch, in terms of millibars, in general, the pressure runs about 1,013 millibars. Now, pressure changes a lot, and some of the things you guys have been che checking is pressure tendency, you know, rising, falling, okay, so the pressure isn't always constant. Here's the inches that you guys have been recording so for your weather log. Is inches of mercury. Mm -hmm. And I'll talk about why inches of mercury. They're like, really? Okay, we're going to talk about that here in a minute. And the other one, we actually we use this a lot. I'll put the word science here. Um, I know this is a science, but um, other forms of physical science, um, chemistry, a lot of times we use units of atmospheres. Okay, so as you're walking around here, instead of 113 millibars, we'd say it's, a, it's about one atmosphere. Or it is, we'll use it in terms of, of atmospheres. Units of atmospheres is a unit of, of, of measuring pressure. So let's see what today's pressure is. Can't remember what this is going to take me up to. There's so many different, um, so many different uh, websites. Oop, doesn't want to do that. Yeah. So many different, and we were just talking about that. You're like, who's, who's to say which forecast is right? So many different forecasts up there. So if we look at current conditions, 
for today's pressure, it will be in inches of, or inches or inches of mercury. I'm going to the um, weather underground. Um, okay. Let's see if we can find the pressure. Very good. 30.18. Um, looks like they're not giving us tendency, which I don't know why they don't do that. But it's pretty high because if we go back to that slide, you know, the 30.18 inches, okay, usually, you know, a typical atmospheric pressure would be 29.92 instead of the 30.18. So it's kind of high. So actually, speaking of really high ones, you're looking in your weather log? Yeah, I swear I just had a really high one then. Because this actually talks about, kind of puts things into perspective. So that gray stuff is supposed to be liquid mercury, kind of in a, in a maybe a mercury barometer. But um, we have issues with the weather if the pressure is really high, and we have issues with the weather if the pressure is really low. <laughs> okay. So a high pressure, have you ever seen the H's on the weather map? High pressure. You ever seen the L's on the weather map? Low pressures. Okay. So high pressures, actually, we're going to put a name to them in this chapter. They're going to be called anticyclones for high pressures. And low pressures are going to be cyclones. It's, you know, L, <coughs> cyclone, H, anticyclone. Okay. But high pressures, um, um, and like Autumn was saying, you know, if you get up to 31 is pretty high. 31.42 is the highest recorded sea level pressure in the United States. And we're at 30.18. So the thing is, with the inches, it doesn't take much to really make a big difference. Um, I said the H's, and so remember up here, these are all H's. Um, we're going to call them um, anticyclones. I just think that's kind of a neat name for our high pressures. Okay, if you see an H on a weather map and it's running 30.71, that's a pretty strong high pressure. Um... So average sea level pressure in terms of millibars, like you saw on the previous slide, 1,013 millibars, inches of mercury, 29.92 inches of mercury. What would happen if it did go over like 31.42? Um, it's just, we'll talk about that, see what would happen. Um, it depends, the, the anticyclone, the nature of an anticyclone would be really exaggerated. So a lot of times anticyclones are like clear skies. Um, they can be sometimes blocking though, which means they clear and they block precipitation basically from kind of moving into your area, your ages. So they can, yeah, that's what comes to mind anyway, if it's really hot. So the lows are the exciting ones. The lows are, highs are exciting in that, you know, if it was really high, you know, but lows are things that bring um, the things what we call the um, severe weather. Okay, um, starting close to home, tornadoes. When we talk about tornadoes coming up, in the middle of a tornado, in the eye of a tornado, is a low pressure. Okay, um, hurricanes in the middle of a hurricane, low pressure. And actually, here it talks about how how low the pressure is in the in the eye of a hurricane. Actually, is a player for how intense the hurricane. So we have Wilma and Katrina up here. Uh, Wilma was central low pressure of 26.12 inches of mercury, okay, or 882 millibars of pressure. Um, Hurricane Katrina, a little bit higher because it's low. So that's why they say no torn the eye of the tornado is always comes. That's, I think, yeah, that would be correct. There is something to be said. No, I don't know. I the, That's what uh, the, I've always been told. I know the eye of the of a tornado yes, actually tornadoes. is the vortex. So yeah. actually, that is where we have um, um, upward motion. And then we have swirling around. We have strong winds around it. And then we have a vortex. So I don't I think I call it's that calm. Cyclones, or, the I mean, eye, like the like eye of a hurricane, hurricane yeah. is calm. The eye of a hurricane is calm. Oh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Um, hurricanes have little kind of tornadoes embedded in them. Yeah, the eye of a tornado, somebody's setting you up. <laughs> the eye of a hurricane is calm, just like the movie The Day After Tomorrow. That's totally right. 
It was a good movie. <laughs> I've watched it here before. Okay. So, um, how do you measure pressure? That dum dum dum, right? Well, it's like if you're measuring pressure in your car, it's tire, you get a pressure gauge, right? And you look at the thing fly out, right? The pressure gauge. Um, well, the, rate, the way we measure pressure in the atmosphere, I'm going to talk about two ways the liquid mercury barometer, liquid mercury barometer, and the aneroid barometer. So if you want to put liquid next to that, you can. Did you guys know that um, that thermometers used to have liquid mercury in them? Mm -hmm. Okay. So actually... Well, that's what I was thinking when, when you were saying it was mercury, that they measure the pressure with those liquid thermometers. Yeah. So they're messy. This is a mercury barometer. It's very messy. So what you have down at the bottom, I'll put all this whole slide up here. We'll kind of look at the figure... Um, what you have, this is an open pan, open liquid, I'll put an L for liquid, HG is the symbol for mercury. So when I say open, I mean it's open here. The top. Okay, yep, it's open to the top. So basically they're, they're counting on, <laughs> yeah, don't put your finger in it. They're counting on it being open to the atmosphere. They're counting on basically the gases banging on it. So as it bangs on it, what happens is it will force the liquid up that glass tube. And that glass tube is closed up here. So here it's closed. Yeah. It just comes spilling There it's closed. And actually it's not just closed. It was, there was a vacuum that was created in it. So basically you fill it with mercury. You take your, you take your closed end. Okay, put, this is your closed end. You fill it with mercury put your finger over it and you let it kind of dip into your open pan and then you let it set. Hmm. Okay, so then you're ready for it to be a barometer. Cool. So the greater the pressure, the more it goes up and then the inches goes from basically measuring this column right here. This column is what we gives us our inches. Okay, so when the pressure is rising, that's because there's more activity down here pressure, it shoves it up here, and it gives you more inches. Okay, so I brought one of these, and I think I brought one of these the other day. So this is an aneroid barometer, and these are the non-messy ones. <laughs> so a barometer, you could not, or excuse me, a liquid mercury barometer, you wouldn't want to take up in your plane or anything like that. And these actually, a lot of times we have these in our homes. So, like the slide says, the way it works is basically there's, um, it's open to the, you can see the holes, it's open to the atmosphere, and so basically they're counting on it, banging on this little box in here. And the more the pressure, basically it squeezes the box, and watch the black dial. When I squeeze the box, okay, it goes up. Then squeeze it a few times. <laughs> okay. Which I don't know, because so the divisions kind of confuse me, but so... This might not be too bad. So here we have 29 inches, 30 inches, 31 inches. So it looks like it's reading, let's see, that's 30.5, 30.25, about 30.2 inches. Not bad. Now the thing about this is every time you buy one of these, it'll have a cool little silver thing. And the silver thing is for you to go ahead and, and movable. So basically what we would do, yeah, what we would do is line it up, okay, and then 24 hours, we would look at it again to see where the black one, which is responding to pressure, what it, whether the pressure is lowering or where the pressure is raising. Okay, so that would give us actually a tendency. So there's like the three different temp scales. Oh, it's the temperature scale. There's the three different scales. Oh. There's the inches of mercury, and then there's the, I think the centimeters, and what's the inner one? Millimeters. So one of the things that I think is really interesting is just having that simple gizmo people are like, you can kind of get a, an idea of what the weather's going to do. And I don't know if you saw this on the weather log, but according to, and this is not folklore, <laughs> there are some things that are folklore that are like, eh, you know, the whole groundhog thing is terrible at really being, <laughs> you know, okay. Right. 
But in general, remember we said high pressures are anticyclones and low pressures are cyclones. Okay. Anticyclones, like I said, high pressure, clear skies. We'll be talking more about those H's. Okay. A low pressure, these L's, eh, cloudy skies. Okay. And then with regard to tendency, um, if your pressure is rising, if your pressure is rising, that means it's kind of going from an L to an H. If your pressure is rising, so think of basically clearing weather. Um, and when I say pressure, are we okay with pressure and barometric pressure? They're the same thing. Pressure, ch -ch -ch, barometric pressure, it's the same thing. And atmospheric pressure, it's all the same thing. If your pressure is falling, if the tendency is falling, then you probably have a low coming in, which you can expect cloudiness and maybe precipitation. Okay. So I've not, I don't usually emphasize it this early, but I just think it's kind of nice to know that these are the H's and these are the L's on the weather map, and your H's are anticyclones and your L's are cyclones. My husband was telling me, oh my gosh, like um, this year for the NCAA tournament, you and I, I'm a Panthers alumni, so they're maybe going to make it into the basketball. Really? Gosh, yeah. You and, I? and he said Iowa and Iowa State. I don't know about those as much, but you yeah, don't think I will make it? You and I, really? You and I, yeah. But they won the Missouri Valley Championship. That is so cool. I'm excited. So anyway... And I looked for the brackets, and he's sports. like, yeah, I don't, I have not filled out a bracket, like, forever. And he's like, um, they're not out there yet. No, uh, they have, um, like, the division set up, but they don't have who's in what seed yet, because selection, selection Saturday is not happening yet. Okay, that's good. Yeah, that's this coming week. Well, I'm going to fill one up this year. I'm going to put you and I, <laughs> Panthers, going all the way. All the way. <laughs> um, I do, like, three or four. Mix up a little bit. What's that? I do them. I mix it up a little bit. Okay. I do like three or four. What do you mean? You do three or four different brackets? Yeah. That's a great idea. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the suggestion. Let's see which no, one. Through you and I doesn't work out. You yeah. <laughs> the what I want it to be and what I think it might be. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, so pressure. It's important to look for the H's on the weather map and the L's on a weather map. And the thing is, is if you look at the details, H's will be high pressure and L's will be low pressure, right? So it's important for the weather map. But as you know, like the United States has got different elevations, the United States. So if we look at a weather map of the United States, you're like with the different elevations, one of the things you would tell me is that the upper elevations, you know that's going to be a low, okay? Because you climb a mountain and the air gets thinner and you have a lower pressure up there. Right? And for the sea level locations, you know that's going to be high because the air is thicker down here and there's more gas particles, so it's a, always a high pressure at sea level. Okay? But here's the deal, and sometimes I have to convince myself of this, but when you look at a weather map, they have already corrected for elevation. Okay? They have adjusted for elevation. And so this is how this works. So I have three locations on this figure. Okay, and look to see how they've adjusted for elevation. Now, the first station, the station A, is at sea level. Okay, so there's no adjusting for the air being thinner. So basically, the the barometer that was there at the station read 1,008 millibars pressure, and that is actually what they're going to report: 1,008 millibars. Now. Station B is going up in elevation. The air is thinner. The pressure is less. So what the barometer says there is 915 millibars. Okay? Makes sense. So here's the deal. Before you put it on a weather map to kind of compare apples with apples, you need to go ahead and adjust for its elevation, for the air being thinner up there. You add 99 millibars. Now, how would I know that? Well, I have to look up on a table. Yeah, you'd have to look it up on a table. So this one happens to be one meter, excuse me, 1,000 meters above sea level, and we added 99 millibars. I don't know if it's linear or not, probably not. So you have to kind of look it up. So what you see on the weather map is 1,014 millibars, okay? So the next one, or the last one, 
even higher elevation, um, not quite twice as high. Okay. And notice in this case, we're instead of adding 99 millibars, <coughs> we have to add back 180 millibars. So is it like one millibar per meter? Like I said, to me, intuitively, no, it wouldn't be because it wouldn't stay constant. Right. So, but here it's kind of looking yeah, like kind of something really like close. that. Yeah, yeah, they are very close. So I'm going to put map. Here is actually what your map is going to say. Okay. And up here, this first column is what your barometer says. Okay. And then this middle column is what you added. And you're adding pressure for elevation. So kind of, can you see where, when I said map down here, actually the one that has the highest pressure, you know, corrected for its elevation is station C. Mm -hmm. See, what I don't know, see, to me, what do you guys think? It seems like um, that, that aneroid barometer over there, if you were like at Mile High Stadium or whatever, it's going to read, yeah, it's going to, thank you, it's going to read less pressure. So, by the way, Mile High Stadium, have you heard this too? That like you, the home run thing is different in Mile High Stadium. <laughs> because like the air is thinner and awesome. basically less Travel resistance and it travels very, further. Very yeah. yeah. And they talk about players that aren't used to playing up there. Yeah. Have trouble getting Athletes. acclimating to the... I wonder air, if, like, breathing. athletes who are used to upper elevations when they come down to sea level, if they I also bet, have issues. I bet they're, no, they're more, they're more they, conditioned. They're more say, conditioned? Yeah, it's always plus? In better yeah. shape, mm. yeah, if they're used to breathing less oxygen. Okay. Maybe get like That's a burst good of oxygen to know. down here. <laughs> I like that. So this figure is similar to the other figure. Instead of three stations, there's two stations. But you can see... Um, you know, picking on Denver, right, um, which is above sea level, about 1,600 meters. So in this case, you can see what was added onto the, um, what was added onto the pressure that they get from their gizmo in order to report a pressure. Okay. All right. So this, I feel like, is kind of, we maybe hit it in... Uh, this is climbing a mountain and the air getting thicker sort of thing. Sorry. No, did I say that wrong? I did. Climbing a mountain, the air getting thinner. Okay. Air pressure will increase um, at your, if, you're, if you're near the Earth's surface. Okay. And increase with density. And so um, this actually is kind of showing you a movable piston where I think this is fun. It's kind of trap these, these gas particles. And remember, we talked about pressure gauges. So actually, this gauge is reflecting the activity of those gas particles. So basically, it's a movable piston. If we put a couple weights on it, okay, we can see the piston move down, and no gas particles have escaped. But basically, we have confined those gas particles to a smaller volume. And notice what happened to the pressure. It increased. Yeah. We're squeezing them down. Okay. We have more um, pounds per square inch in that last one. So with increasing pressure, we have increasing density. Oops, sorry. From increasing density, we have increasing pressure. All right. Um, so this actually is the, you see the three columns. We have height above the Earth's surface. We have what does the pressure do at that elevation and what is the temperature of that elevation. So um, here we kind of have, this is increasing, this is, this is going up in elevation in units of kilometers. So you see the decreasing pressure, air getting thinner, decreasing pressure, and we see the cooling temperatures. Okay? We said that's going to happen all the way in the troposphere up to the tropopause, right? Yep. So, so let's see if we can see where that, let's look at that last column, see if we can see where the temperatures are getting warmer. They all look cold to me. <laughs> okay. Well, when you've done the 56, they stay constant, and then they start to come. 
Mm -hmm. I'm thinking. I'm thinking. Autumn's right. You guys see that too. So does this make sense? What we talked about in an earlier unit here, you know, all the way up here, it's getting colder. Mm -hmm. And then here, it starts to get warmer. Negative two Celsius in the in the stratosphere. That's pretty cool. I mean, neat, not cool. It's actually pretty warm. <laughs> Negative two. Okay, so that would be I'd call that the tropopause, okay, somewhere around there. Okay, but the point here is that going up in elevation, you see the decreasing, decreasing pressure. No doubt. Yeah, no doubt. If you get up to, up to here, you know, the air is so thin that instead of being 1,013 millibars, it's 0.798 millibars. You know, like, do. You need some sort of suit, I think. <laughs> Gain a little pressure. Um, we, we actually are going to talk about this probably on Friday, but I'm going to put, um, let me put an H down here. Okay, and I'm going to put an L up there. Can you buy that? That's basically a column going up. We have an H here and an L up there. Okay. So anytime somebody talks about horizontal, I'm hoping we're kind of thinking horizontal like this. Horizontal. Okay. So sometimes we have, well, Look at the weather map. We have H's and L's. <laughs> okay, sometimes we have horizontal differences in pressure. And how do we get those horizontal differences in pressure? I'm going to talk about three different ways. Okay, one is that you can have chunks of air at different temperatures. Okay, chunk of air over here and chunk of air over here at different temperatures. So if we're trying to kind of gauge what the pressure would be, think of warm air as being fluffy. If warm air is fluffy, it kind of gives you a low pressure. Think of cold air as being dense, and it kind of creates the high pressure. So picture those gas particles. Okay. So warm air is fluffy. And since it's fluffy, it basically brings you an L. And cold air is dense, and think of a high pressure. All right, that's one way. Here's one, okay, this one is kind of fun because it, it, again, it feels, after I explain it, it makes sense, but at first glance you would think, well, if there's a chunk of air that has, it's moist, has a lot of water vapor, water gas in it, versus a chunk of air that's dry, you might think the one that's moist is like, oh, that's oppressive, I can't breathe, that's really dense, okay, but that's actually backwards. The one that's moist actually is a lower pressure, okay, and I'll try to kind of convince you of that. But moist air is a low, okay? So moist air just inherently will be a glow. Um, a dry air, chunk of air, will be a high pressure. And the reason moist air is a low has to do with the, this number down here, this 18.02. This actually, um, the H2O, of course, is water, right? And a water, I'm going to put the letter G next to it for water gas. The water gas is actually lighter than the other stuff. Okay. So the water vapor actually makes it less dense. Lighter. Lighter. So. Well, it kind of makes sense with the drier high pressure because they say that yeah, high pressure is clearing. Well, that's so true. Think the high pressure would push moisture out of the air, yeah. which would make the But it's dry. kind of which comes first. To me, right. you have the high that makes the dry, and the dry is a high. Right. <laughs> gosh, you're right. I hadn't thought about that. It is. Oh, gosh. Let me go ahead, and I wasn't going to, but you guys have this figure? Let's look at this figure right quick. And I want to emphasize down here at the bottom, because we're talking about horizontal temperatures. Check out here, okay, here is the Earth's surface. You know how I usually use half marks to make the Earth's surface. 
So just in this situation, let me change colors to, I think red will show up okay. I said if it's cold, think high pressure, and I said if it's warm, think low pressure. I said if it's cold, think high pressure. If it's warm, think low pressure, which is cool. Now, I want to, and this will help later on, I want to point out something. Look at the upper elevations. These are columns, right? Let's go up at upper elevations, and we have actually something a little different. Here at upper elevations, okay, because the cold one, we'll pick on the cold one first, because the cold one kind of squished down, <laughs> basically at upper elevations, check this out. Do you see there's not very many? It's pretty sparse up there. Actually, at upper elevations, and I don't want to confuse you, but upper elevations, a column of cold air, we do have a low. Huh. Okay. And at upper elevations for a column of warm air, does it look like there's a few particles compared to right next to it? We do have a high. And I think that's what this figure was supposed to emphasize. Okay, so you could have two columns of air, okay, a cold column and a, and a warm column. And at the bottom, you'd have high and low, respectively. At upper elevations, would be the opposite. Low and All right. There was a third one. The third one actually is something we've already talked about, which is kind of fun. So we said that one of the ways you can get a chunk of air to go up is convergence. So you see that word convergence again. And here, though, think of basically, again, it's the same thing, convergence. Think of, though, that is creating a high pressure. All these little particles moving, okay? So convergence creates a high. Divergence creates a low. Okay, so basically, if you have a the chunk of air where stuff is kind of scooting away from it, it creates a low there. Um, I did. I don't think I told you guys this. I did the whole candy thing, right? You throw candy out on a playground and everybody, adults and kids, <laughs> converges to it, okay? <laughs> and then the whole, the diverging, somebody vomits, right? Only the mother stays behind, <laughs> okay? Somebody vomits and everybody diverges, right? Oh, goodness. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and watch. I have a movie queued up that talks about some of the stuff and, and kind of goes on a little bit further. So let's...